I fall to him, Reverend Jesh, peace and country, Yen of Win Billish, or Hatha Haravet Hobokta. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak on this bill and I have to say I put an effort into understanding it because we're dealing with massive figures here and different terminology and finance which is not my area but I've learned over the years that I've been in here to take a note and I want to thank the Library and Research Service always for their hard work and for the I should say the fool's guide to the legislation that they prepare for us on a regular basis and under extreme pressure. So we're talking about the Future Ireland Fund and Infrastructure, Climate and Nature Fund Bill, six parts, 37 sections and two schedules. And we're talking about a fund of 100 billion in the foreseeable future. And it is a joyful story, isn't it, that finally we're seeing sense to put aside money to, so that we won't never see this country stuck in the manner that we have on a number of occasions in the past. And yet I find myself agreeing with um, one of the Labour TDs who said it's been framed in a negative way. And it certainly is, and let's start with the elderly, and I have a particular interest in that as I get older myself, that we're now labelling older people as a problem, a societal problem, rather than an absolute delight that people are living longer and contributing to the society and actually saving money. And that's not put in here at all. And we're looking at a sovereign fund, which I should be jumping for joy, because we've all heard about the sovereign fund in Norway that they had for the oil. But this sovereign fund gives me great concern. So just for, for, for simplicity and just for people that might in the future look at this and wonder what it's all about, I think it's important just to set out the, the major points to it, that we're setting up two funds, the Future Ireland Fund, and that fund will be made up of 0.8% of the GDP every year until 2035 or 36. And we can't touch that fund then till after 41. And it has been pointed out by various colleagues on this side of the house that the GDP that we all learned off by heart and learned what it meant. And then we discovered it wasn't very reliable at all because it was given a misleading um, um, picture of how successful Ireland was because of the distortion of it by foreign direct investment. We're now going to use that here. Nobody's explained that to us. The minister hasn't explained it to us how we're now reliant on that. The other fund then, in its name is the Infrastructure, Climate and Nature Fund Bill, Fund Bill, will two billion will go into that every year, plus the amount that comes from the existing fund that's going to be dissolved. So we're going to have two billion every year. So we'll have four billion the first year, and that will continue, I think, until 26 and then we can take down some of that. Now, my difficulty with all of this is when I look at it, it's set out in such a way that it's really restricted. The, as, first of all, the money has been invested for maximum return, which I don't necessarily think is the right way to be using public money for maximum return with no guarantee that any amount of it will be invested in the country or even a substantial amount of it, or any amount of it. And then we will be dependent on the timing of that. So if the country needs that money, it will all depend on how it's investment, how it's invested, and where it can be drawn down. And then, so there are two funds, ostensibly to help the government in the future cope with difficulties with expenditure, that they won't have enough money to spend because there's a downturn in the economy. So the first one, 0.8% of a GDP every year regardless. The second one, 2 billion every year regardless, being put away. And then access to that is through two ways. One for general expenditure and the other one for climate and nature fund. But that, so 25% can be taken out for general expenditure and up to 22.5%, a lesser figure for, for climate and nature. So we get lost in all of these figures and you say, what is this all about? And why can't I agree with this when it's a wonderful idea to save any mother, any sensible woman at home tries to put a few bob aside, the importance of saving. But we're doing this saving in a particular way, at a particular time when we should be spending now and not leaving enough flexibility to be able to access that funding in the next 10 years when we need it. Now, 
I, I, yesterday I pointed out that there were 71 people on trolleys in Galway. 71 people on trolleys. Again, I don't think there's anyone here at the moment, but well, there are very few of us here, but the ones are haven't spent any time on trolley. Members of my family have. But to me, it's an obscenity to spend any time on a trolley. And not alone is it an obscenity, but we know from repeated evidence from the consultants that at a minimum, 330 or 350 people every year die premature deaths for directly related to the time spent on trolleys. So, and you say, what's that? Because it's, 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 health has been described as a whole. I don't use words like that. Health is a basic human right like housing. So how did we get to this situation? And I've had the privilege of sitting on a health forum for 10 years of my life, and I watched the systematic running down of the public health system from 2006 to 2016, 10 years. It started with the PD-led government who knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. And that's when the commodification of our health service really went into high dough. At the same time, parallel with that, we channeled the money and our solutions into private medicine. I was a member of City Council when we rezoned land for the building of a private hospital and the argument put forward for that was 20% of the beds would be reserved for public beds. Magically disappeared, of course, as soon as the rezoning was done by majority vote. So we could get lost in the anecdotes that I'm telling, except there's a point to them. It was the product, the commodification of health, of housing, and it's been brought to an absolute pitch with the HAP scheme, which is over a billion when you put it in with the other schemes, the rental accommodation scheme and the other long-term leasing, over a billion of money. So here we are with these two funds, and we're tying them in to a, a GDP. We're tying them into maximum uh, um, return. And we're putting the emphasis on spending, albeit, I think, capital spending, but it's not entirely clear. In addition to that, we're linking it with the national debt. And again, I'm no expert here in relation to the, annu the debt, but it's completely fitcha fucha It's entwined. The use of that money seems to be entwined, entwined with the annualised cost of servicing the national debt. Carbon credits has not been excluded that this money could be used for purchasing our way, our way out of obligations. And in the pre-legislative scrutiny, this was raised, could this money be used for carbon credits? And we were told the argument doesn't arise in relation to the first fund because that doesn't become effective till 2041. So we don't need to worry our little heads about that. But after 41, God knows we'll be here and they can worry about that then, whether the money is going to be used for carbon purchase. In relation to the second one, we were told and reassured that the Infrastructure, Climate and Nature Fund are not intended to be used as carbon credits. Not intended. No policy, no guarantees at all. Meaningless words, really, given different governments and different priorities. And then we look at the human rights and where this is going to be, the money is going to be invested. And I look back at a question that I asked courtesy in my office, who did a lot of work on it, and in relation to this report. Irish Business and Human Rights, a snapshot of large firms operating in Ireland, Trinity College, Dublin, January 24, just this year. And I've looked at Mary Lawler, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, and I've looked at the Irish Coalition for Business and Human Rights. And I looked at all them in the context of how we are going to ensure that the billions that were put aside of public money is not going to be used in companies who have little regard for human rights. And I don't see the word human right mentioned anywhere in the what's before me, and I've read everything before me. What's mentioned is environment, eh, social and governance issues. Now, to me, that's pathetic. Having spent four years of my life on the public accounts, I saw governance that you wouldn't expect anywhere in, in the entities that came before us, including the universities. And we've seen the fruits of that in the last weeks again in Limerick University. So environment, social and governance. What I don't see are human rights. What I don't see spelled out is what we should or should not be investing in. 
And so if we look at the report of that, and of the report from Trinity College in January of this year, and over half of the 50 largest companies in Ireland, in the Irish economy, scored 30% or less on corporate uptake of the UN guiding principles, principles on business and human rights. And so where did they come from? They came from a UN framework that embedded pro to protect, to respect and to remedy 31 guiding principles. And the Human Rights Council endorsed them in 2011. And today, 32 states have taken them up, including Ireland. And Ireland was very good and launched its first action plan in 2017. Plan is out of date for three years now, not a sign of a new plan. Not a sign of a new plan in relation to our obligations and whether we're going to continue uh, protecting, respecting and remedying under the 31 guiding principles. At the 10th anniversary of these principles in 2021, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights stated, uptake needs to move widely into the mainstream of the business community and so on. So specifically then in relation to the report, which was a snapshot of large firms operating in Ireland, published in this year, 45 pages. The report examined the implementation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, as I said, of the 50 largest companies in Ireland. And separately as well, parallel with it, they looked at the next 10 largest state-owned enterprises in this country. Three measurements were used, three themes, governance and policy commitments, embedding respect for human rights and conducting human rights diligence and grievance mechanisms. Findings, 86% of the companies scored less than 50%. 86% of the countries scored less than 50% of the available marks. While 88% of the companies made explicit commitments to human rights, specific commitments to workers' rights were more limited. And 28% of the companies scored no points. And again, Deputy Amerku said earlier he could go on. I could go on too, but I'm going to try and be uh, just limit because I want to say a few more things in the time that I've left. Companies with their domicile or headquarters in Ireland performed on average less well than the sample as a whole. State-owned enterprises fared, fared very poorly, with five of the state-owned enterprises in this country scoring less than one point out of 24. I won't list them out. Well, I will actually. Quilcha, CGA, CIE, Dublin Airport, Authority PLC, Airgrid PLC all scored zero points. The IHREC have commented on that we need to take action. The action plan ran out in 2020 and there isn't a sign of it. And so what am I saying about all of this? The words that are being used here, environment, social and governance, are pathetic given that background, given that failure to embed human rights. And if we go back again to the library and they point out to us the position in relation to the Irish Strategic Investment Fund and the NTMA, which is over that. Oh. During the recent committee discussion of the illegal Israeli settlements divestment bill on the 20th of March this year, Mr. Nick Ashmore, director of ISIF, advised that the NTMA has engaged multiple external investment firms to manage the different parts of its portfolio, which is probably a wise decision, getting different firms, and I have no difficulty with that. But they go on to point out the percentage as referred to earlier, ISEF currently holds investments in companies included on the Human Rights Council database of business enterprises involved in certain activities related to illegal Israeli settlements in Palestine. They did announce that they would be divesting, and that was positive. However, they were divesting of 2.95 million. There still remains 10 million invested in companies that are on the UN database and so on. Now, I would have thought if we're seriously interested in learning from a pandemic and learning from a climate catastrophe, that 
just around the corner, having declared an emergency back in 2019, not led by us, but led by children and concerned people on the ground that forced us into declaring an emergency, plus COVID. I th we, we should learn what do we do with this wonderful opportunity of a sovereign fund and windfall money as a result of taxes from the corporate sector. And if we take COVID, we were in a mess for many reasons, but one of the main reasons was we had utterly failed to resource our public health system. We've still utterly failed to resource it on a regional basis, on a county basis, so that people can learn to trust the public health officials in the event of a new COVID or a new epidemic. In relation to climate change, we are doing it piecemeal with no transformative change. And we should be using these sovereign funds in a different way. Yes, put aside the funds, but we need access to them now and in the immediate future and longer term to bring transformative change. And my worry, having read all of this, is we're proceeding down the very same model that led to the catastrophe in relation to climate change and the financial disaster that deeply affected ordinary people on the ground, not the more privileged classes. So I would have thought in my ignorance, which I'm slowly trying to get rid of as I learn more and more of this language, that we would invest or make a condition that we invest in our own country that we invest with safe returns rather than entering the market. And yes, there is a need to enter the market, but in a balanced way, balanced by government policy. If, if 71 people are on trolleys yesterday, and that's repeated all over the country, there's something seriously wrong. If I have emails on a daily basis where I email absolutely appealing like all TD, TDs on behalf of people who are waiting 20 years in Galway City, 20 years on a waiting list. They've been forgotten. Such is the crisis with homelessness and other pressures on staff that they're waiting 20 years. And if we come back then from 20 to 15, and I can genuinely tell you that I'm getting replies telling me they have no idea when these people can be housed, these tenants. Now, with a financial brain, you'd say, God, there's something wrong here. We need to do something here. We need to finance the local authorities with staff, with expertise and with money to build public housing on public land. We have, we're not doing that. We built our last house in Galway in 2009 from, directly from the public authority and never built another house until 20 or 21 under pressure. We have an ongoing task force in Galway that is not fit for purpose, that has become another bureaucratic layer as opposed to how much land is there in Galway, how much of it is public, how many houses can we build on it, and a whole range of measures. None of that's happening. Similarly with hospitals, what infrastructure is necessary now and in the next 10 years, and how can this sovereign fund deliver on that? I see none of that here. And while I agree in principle that it's a very good idea to have a sovereign fund, this is anything but a sovereign fund. This is putting money aside to, to deal with the economic downturn that's going to happen because we are refusing to make our country less dependent on the outside world in terms of energy sufficiency and having the communities on board. We're not doing that. Adequate housing, adequate health and public education. That's what makes a society and a republic, and that's what the sovereign funds should be used for.